Hello, everyone. Welcome to our program today, Ash Petal, the grim, gruesome version of the Cinderella fairy tale. We're excited to have our guest speaker today. I'm going to do an introduction. My name is Jennifer Book. I'm the assistant director at Sandusky Library. Um, if you have any questions after the program, um, you're welcome to contact me or our presenter. Mary Ann Bensavango is an arts analyst and writer in the arts and humanities, including in folklore. She studied creative writing at Bowling Green State University and depth psychology at Pacifica Graduate Institute. She has taught college English, folklore, and children's literature classes and preschool art programs and has written for newspapers in arts and entertainment and community, human community interest articles. She enjoys writing fiction and poetry, nature, family life, and being a grandmother. I'm now gonna turn it over to Mary Ann. In this presentation today, we're going to look at different versions of Cinderella from around the world. Probably the most um, known one or favorite perhaps is the Walt well, Disney Cinderella. This image is, um, I give credit to Disney for using this image. Um, it is taken from the old French version as told by Charles Perrault. Charles Perrault wrote for the French court. And so the Disney version is very pleasant. Everything's beautiful, magical, um, a little less violent than some of the tales. One of the things that we are looking for in the tales today or looking at is the violence in the tales. Um, and also there's so many, like I said, different variants of Cinderella from the old world, olden days, Disney Cinderella or the Disney type Cinderella, as we say. And um, this is Cinderella as it was imagined by a young girl, Gracie at age three, and the image as you can see from Crayola. So in the French version of the Disney version that it's derived from, it was pleasant, but not quite so pleasant for peasants, one letter away from being pleasant. Of course, they didn't have the, the wealth and all the money that the royal kingdom castle and courts did, and they had to work harder for, for what they what they had. But Ash Puddle, the German version, as recorded by the Brothers Grimm, by contrast, is very, very grim. We have some of the misuse and abuse of Cinderella in the French version or the Disney version that everyone is most familiar with, but some people would be so surprised to find out just how much violence there is in other tales of Cinderella or other variations of the tales. In fact, we might even wonder if the word grim, as we know it, like grim and gruesome could be um, derived from the Grimm brothers, or if that was just a coincidence. Abuse and cruelty towards Ash Puddle. She is being made the servant, which should not be her role in the family. In most all the Cinderella stories, the father, of Cinderella is a rather absent father to her due to the fact that Cinderella or Ash Puddle's mother died and the father has remarried and he's so busy paying attention to his new wife when at home or he's so busy off at work and distant traveling that he is what is called in folk tales or fairy tales, the absent father, even when he's around, he turns a blind eye to the plight of Ash Puddle or Cinderella. The name Ash Puddle is a variant of Cinderella, of her name. A cinder, of course, is a cinder wood, a little piece of a burnt wood. And Ella is little or elf, so Cinderella is a cinder elf who's made to sleep by the fireplace or clean the ashes of the fireplace. And it's the same with Ash Puddle. The ash means that she sleeps in the ash or is just a little ash or ashen, always has ashes all over her. And Puddle, 
is Cinder Ash Bottom. She has to sit by the fireplace. She sleeps there. And she does all the chores for everyone um, at their every whim, as we're probably all familiar with. So Cinderella or Ash Puddle both and all the other variants, they are a tale or tales of desire, hopes and wishes. How to make the come, come true, even in, when in desolation and despair. Ash Puddle reacts against the abuse, neglect, and even the violence done to her and in the story more strongly than the French Cinderella. Cinderella is very, very kind and rewarded for her kindness. Ash Puddle, kind, but of course, they're both pretty much forced to do what they do and they kind of have to tolerate it with a kind attitude because that's their livelihood. They're still dependent upon the father and the stepmother. But Ash Petal is more proactive and some of the other variants of Cinderella have the character also be very active in pursuing her goals to work against the abuse and the seemingly terrible fate of having to endure it forever. Um, in Ash Puddle, she has a deceased mother as a spirit helper, which replaces the fairy godmother that's in the French version. In the fairy godmother version, uh, she just appears um, seemingly out of nowhere. Of course, she could actually be seen as Cinderella's deceased mother. Uh, the spirit of the mother coming to her like a guardian angel. And in Ash Puddle, the deceased mother is not a fairy godmother, but is directly, immediately the mother, or obviously. And then in these fairy tales, we have a lot of the folklore uh, sayings, beliefs, ideas. Um, it goes back to the old saying, blood is thicker than water. And apparently that's even from the um, Beyond the Grave in the Cinderella Tales. Ash Petal and her deceased mother's magic work together against the abuse of the stepmother and the stepsisters. When the father is going off on a business trip, he asks all the girls what they would like him to bring them back. The stepsisters reply, they want beautiful gowns, beautiful gems, beautiful shoes. Everything's quite material. And they expect a lot as if they're used to being very spoiled. And they don't really say it very kindly. They demand it more than ask. Ash Puddle simply asks her father to bring her back the first branch of a hazel tree that rubs against his hat on his way home. He does this and brings it home and she puts it on her mother's grave and she's always crying at her mother's grave. So what so happens is that as she's crying these tears over the hazel branch, the water of the tears is what waters the tree and it grows roots and it becomes a hazel tree. Hazel was very popular in old folklore as being a rather magical type of tree. So of course, here we have in this story, we have a hazel branch instead of a magic wand. So we see that any wand, well, not when we go to the toy store nowadays, which is often made of metal or plastic, but that any wand way back in those times was made of wood, possibly metal if a metal smith was around for a magic wand, um, but a branch or anything that you would carry um, to have fire, a torch or whatever would, would be wood. 
and therefore the branch is a living branch and that's where the whole idea of magic wand well, maybe not the whole idea but that's where part of the magic wand idea comes from in the tree resides the mother spirit so the role of the deceased mother in the spirit of the tree is that the mother within the tree is a guardian angel avenger and she is out to make her daughter's wishes come true she is out to work against and the terrible fate that is being thrown at her daughter by a woman who is obviously a narcissistic, abusive, even violent, as we'll see towards the end, just how violent she is. And in the old folklore beliefs also, a bird would carry the soul of the deceased. So often if one would see a bird at a special moment or special time of synchronicity, perhaps, um, when you're thinking about that person and missing them, it was said that the bird was the deceased or the soul of the deceased coming to say hello or to visit. And most these tales, all of the Cinderella type tales have helping animals. And in Ash Puddle, in this case, the helping animal picks up lentils out of the fireplace when Ash Petal needs to get to the Royal Ball because the stepmother tells Ash Petal that there is no way she would have time to get ready for the ball because she has to pick out all the lentils out of the fireplace and make sure that she has sorted them, the bad lentils that aren't good for eating or in the best shape or condition dried out or whatever or spoiled from the good lentils that are potentially you know, um, potential for for eating suitable and when having to do that it's like winnowing the bad grain from the good grain and it's an interesting motif in the tale because that's what we're doing in the story. As the story is told, the idea in the tale, as far as morals and customs, commentary on human behavior, is that we are looking at comparing and contrasting the good and the bad from one another. And the birds come to help Ash Puddle as they do Cinderella in the French version, because Cinderella and Ash Puddle deserve it. They are deserving. They are not nasty to others. They are doing everything for everybody else and enjoying it and still being kind. I mentioned a little bit about the wand motif earlier as the hazel branch and ash puddle. I really like these illustrations because I really like the leaves in the patterns that remind me of the hazel branch and the hazel tree. And the gown is a rags to riches motif. Almost all Cinderella type tales are a rag to riches story. The wand, I already mentioned that the hazel branch that the father brought back is a magic wand, at least as far as Ash Puddle is concerned, she put her wishes into the branch of the tree and made that connection with her mother in that way. And as the tree grows, the connection between them grows stronger and stronger. The idea of the slippers in the tail or having beautiful feet that can slip easily into the slipper is 
and they are often said to be glass slippers. In ash petal, they are gold. Uh, but the idea is that graceful feet or graceful step, one steps gracefully through life, in life, throughout life, not stepping on other people's toes, being polite, and also the slipper, she leaves it behind when she slips away at midnight. The difference in the French tail and ash puddle tail is that in the French tail, the slipper slips off her foot, whereas in ash puddle, the prince puts pitch on the steps because there's more than one ball and he's put the pitch on the steps so that she would lose her shoe, that it would stick to the pitch. And therefore he could try to fit who would um, find the fitting princess, the right princess. If the shoe fits, wear it. Who is fitting to be her, uh, the queen? And so in all the tales, like all folk tales, fairy tales, it will reflect social customs, belief, commentary on human behavior, uh, faith in the world, what we stand for, who we are, what we will tolerate, all of these things. To be a princess or ladylike, apparently, the idea was to arrive late, leave early, and must have beauty of spirit. And that, remember, the outer beauty is only skin deep since the spell is broken at midnight and she has to return home to her rags. And in many cases, the gown returns to rags as she returns home. When the prince searches for Ashpuddle, his bride-to-be, the step family keeps Ashpuddle hidden in her room in the house upstairs from the prince. But justice will prevail. There is retribution. Goodness is rewarded and evil is punished. And Ashpuddle will get her due reward with the help of her mother. Ruku, Ruku, there's blood on the shoe. There's blood on the shoe. It's a false bride. It's not the true bride. This tale in Ash Puddle has the false bride motif. And here, the warning comes from the birds who are flying above the stepsisters when they try to go off with the prince to the castle to be the bride. So what happens is this stepmother is so, so violent and abusive that when the prince has the first one of the daughters try on the shoe, it doesn't fit. And the mother, she's abusive to her own children. She will stop at nothing. She says, go ahead cut off your toes, then you will fit the shoe. Once you are queen, you won't need to do anything anymore anyways. You'll have servants do everything for you. So, believe it or not, yes, the daughter listens to the abusive mother and cuts off her toes, hops on the horse with the prince to run off to the castle to be his bride, and that's when the bird says, Ruku, Ruku, there's blood on the shoe. Different versions of the tale, even from Germany, have um, different things that the birds say. Uh, in one of the versions I have, I have, um, this is um, the Roku, Roku, there's blood on the shoes, is one of the chantings of the birds, like a magical um, rhyme. So here again, we have the, the old saying, if the shoe fits, wear it. Then the next daughter tries on the shoe and her foot doesn't fit either. So the step that her mother tells her, go ahead, your toes fit fine in there, but cut off your heel. 
because that way you can wear the shoe and who cares? Uh, he, as queen, you won't have to do anything anyways. You won't really need to get around. She does that. And the prince, the second time, sees the blood pouring out from her shoe and takes her back home and wants to find the true bride both times. But he is now knowing that neither one of them are the true bride. You'll see that in some of the other tales, there is the false bride motif also. So there's the bird warning of the uh, blood on the shoe. Mm. I don't know how that um, that YouTube uh, link got up there, but we have the retribution from the mother. Um, I do know what song that is, though. It's a uh, time for a cold change. So I guess maybe um, Cinderella and Ash want to let us know that um, retribution is coming and um, it is time for a change to get away from the fireplace and the ashes and the fires. So in the wand or the stem here, um, you see the drop of blood that the retribution comes from the mother. Now, the tale, the last one with the um, ash petal, when we look at the shoes and the blood on the shoe, what that idea originated from, at least this is what most people speculate, is that um, it comes from the Chinese Cinderella which was the original Cinderella Yeshen, because in China, in the ancient days, they had foot binding, which were to make the feet very small and delicate. And it was actually believed that to be royal meant to take very tiny, delicate steps. And you did have people carry you in a carriage or you did have people that um, worked for you and you really didn't need to walk. So that idea um, comes from, as like I said, most folklorists believe from the original Cinderella from China, which is usually thought of as the oldest Cinderella story known. In Ye Shen, it is a similar story. Stepmother, father, the mother died, the father remarries. In this case, there's a pond, and in that pond, Ye Shen meets the magic fish, who is her pet goldfish. And in Chinese folklore, the goldfish signifies luck and prosperity. Therefore, there is the magic fish in Ye Shen. She wants to meet the king, the prince. She wants to be queen. She wants to go to the ball, but uh, the stepmother again does not let her. This is so common across the board in all these tales that there is always the quest of and to suffer the ordeal, what do you have to go through to meet the prince? What are your tasks? What does everybody else make you do? All the chores, they um, make you stay away from the ball. They don't want you to meet the prince. Uh, and in this case, the stepmother is so cruel that she makes sure that Ye Shen cannot have any of her wishes granted. The stepmother kills Ye Shen's magical pet fish. And there's this theme here that children's pets are so special to them that it is especially cruel, violent, and abusive to kill a child's pet. And in this case also, the motif or theme is that it is a magical animal 
and that there's an enchanting relationship. And in this tale, the magical helping animal, like there's always the helping animals in the Cinderella tales. In this case, the animal helper is her own pet and they can all be seen as magical, whether they're called magical or not. Because in the fairy tales, birds don't really sew dresses together and birds don't really know how to at one's bidding anyways, pick all the good lentils from out of the fireplace. Um, in this case, the fish grants her wishes. She wants this, she wants that, she needs a gown, she needs shoes, um, she needs to be beautiful, looking to go to the ball or to meet the prince. So the fish performs her wishes, but when the stepmother kills the fish, Ye Shen loves the fish so much and still wants to be close to it that she keeps the fish's bones and she finds surprise that the bones are still magical and that the bones still have the energy of their bond within them. And so that even though the living flesh of the fish is not there anymore, the bones still are of the essence of the fish, just like an ash puddle and some of the other variants when the deceased mother, the living flesh is not there, but the spirit is there. And often the connection is between something that's yet magical or physical, such as the bones of the fish or the wand of the hazel branch or the hazel tree. And so in the end, yes, Ye Shen does get her prince and she is no longer being abused by the stepmother. So we have that retribution that good is rewarded, evil is punished. And what happens? Um, oh, I didn't say before flipping the slide, what happens in the other slide um, here is that the cave that the stepmother and her family, the rest of the family live in, uh, collapses, stones collapse, and they're all killed by stones. They're all stoned to death by a natural catastrophe. And then we have similar violence in the maiden, the frog, and the chief's son, which is an African Cinderella, and there are such interesting uh, motifs in this one in that it is, as we know, there's often the frog prince in so many different uh, cultures. The maiden kisses the frog, he becomes the prince, um, like beauty kisses the beast and beauty and the beast and the beast becomes the prince. Well, here, the frog is the helping animal and it is not the frog per se that turns into the prince but the frog helps her because everything that she needs to become the queen um, is, everything that she needs to become the queen is vomited up by the frog. Sorry, I thought I lost that screen there for a minute. So the frog vomits up the marriage bed, the frog vomits up the gowns she needs, the frog vomits up whatever she needs to be queen. And that vomiting is an interesting um, thing because when we do hear bullfrogs, sometimes they do sound like they're almost burping. So it would just be a commentary um, here on animal behavior, very creative, um, almost funny, just the way we would see a cartoon today, maybe of a frog um, sounding like he's burping and after eating a big meal or something. 
Uh, mm. um, we have the false bride motif and mutilation motif in the African, Chinese, and German tales. In all of them, there are mutilation in these three. You have in the ash puddle, we have the cutting off of the feet, the mutilation. Uh, you can see how greedy and desperate they are to become queen and order other people around and be wealthy and be um, have that status and all that that's um, power, power mongers. And then we have the mutilation of the fish in Yeshan. And then we have in the African Cinderella, we have the false bride, the ones that try to pretend to be the real bride and go in the hut and sleep in the bed in the bride's place. The sisters do that. They try to pretend to be the sister that is the true bride. And what happens is when the falseness is discovered, the false bride gets mutilated, chopped up, chopped up by the king and the prince. So you see bones, mutilation in all of these tales. Then, in the rough face girl, which is a Native American Cinderella, we also have some mutilation. It's not directly um, done to her by others or them herself, mutilating or cutting off her feet or anything like that. But because she tends the fire, the ashes from the fire, here we have the ash puddle theme again with fire and ashes. Um, she's a fire tender and the cinders burn scars onto her face. If one lands on her face and her whole body is scarred up from um, embers and cinders. And you can see that she's bandaged. She doesn't really like the way she looks, but she's proud enough to um, she's proud enough See, I did that subconsciously. We're looking at her with her eyes doing the same thing, but I don't know if you can see me on the screen anymore. It looks like I disappeared, but uh, I'll keep going and, and we'll find out. Um, so she knows who she is and she still has belief in herself. All of these stories also teach girls and remind us all as adults to believe in ourselves, to know that we all have an inner beauty or maybe except the stepsisters, maybe they could learn to cultivate that. Um, but we are of course modeling the Cinderella character in the tale. So we know that we just like Cinderella has an innate goodness or innate beauty that is inward. In the rough face girl, um, the sisters, and these are her real sisters. They're not her stepsisters, usually. Um, this is a Canadian Native American tale. They tease a rough faced girl and gave her that nickname because of her scars. And they think that because of her scars, she doesn't really deserve to have the best clothes. Maybe the clothes are burnt, you know, have burn marks in them or afraid. Um, she's got bandages sometimes. Um, her feet, her shoes are always damaged from fire or not looking as glamorous as everybody else. So they tease her mercilessly. 
And in this one, there's the great spirit who is the invisible one. And the invisible one or spirit is looking for a wife. And everybody says, oh, I want to be his wife. I want to be his wife. Let me meet him. But the invisible one's sister says, no, you cannot meet him until you tell me if you have actually seen him and you know what he's like. What is the, his bow made out of for his arrow? And of course, they all try to make something up. Oh, it's made of this kind of tree. It's made of that kind of tree. Uh, and no one is correct. And so they're deceptive. The sister knows that he's a liar or they are lying. And um, they um, ask for, I'm, I'm very distracted at the moment because I'm not sure if this is working correctly. I hope so. Um, so they're not sure if um, anyone is out there to be his bride. But the rough-faced girl, they think it's preposterous that she wants to go to him. And she claims she has seen him. And the sister asks her, uh, what is his bow made out of? And she says, why, it's made out of the rainbow of the sky. And there's the shape of the bow for the rainbow. And then she has seen his spirit in the sky where the hawks were eyes. In other words, she sees the great spirit. She sees the invisible one in everything. And so she is attuned to nature, which is very, very important, of course, in Native American tradition that in honor of spirit, you were attuned to the earth and sky and all of nature. So because she is so kind and has the gift of sight, she is the new bride, becomes the bride of the great spirit or invisible one. And some people do wonder if when she becomes that bride, does she go to the other side, into the invisible realm? Uh, some say yes, some say no. Uh, I've talked with a couple of people from Native American um, backgrounds and traditions who say they have heard this story told both ways, that there has been the addition of um, the invisible realm, that she goes off into it with him, In the Egyptian Cinderella, there is the idea of being an orphan and the abuse is still there in this tale also. And Rhodopis is taken from Greece into Egypt and she is made to be an Egyptian servant. And in this one, she is different from everybody else. Her hair is not quite as dark, it's golden, golden brown. Her eyes are green. Everyone makes fun of her for having different color eyes, color hair, different style about her. And she doesn't quite blend in, so to speak. They make her do more of the chores. And she's a very, very hard worker, just like all the Cinderella's are. Um, and she has a close connection and um, relationships with the animals in the tale. There are hippopotami, um, falcons, other pond water creatures, 
and um, uh, monkeys, um, and they all help her and are kind to her. And this displays that her nature is so kind that she also, like the Native American rough-faced girl, is attuned to nature and the nature of the animals. Now, being attuned to the animals has the significance of sort of having an inner guidance, having compassion for all living things, and having an inner instinct of that compassion, the way a person would nurture their pet and cherish their pet. In the Egyptian Cinderella, the hawk takes the golden shoes. These are black in the icons, but um, they are, they were in the tale golden shoes and takes the golden shoes to the prince looking for his bride. And the animal rewards her and is the messenger, which is very, very common in both Greek and Egyptian mythology that there is a falcon, a hawk, um, as a messenger, bird, um, having a mercurial character of Mercury, the messenger that had the winged sandals from to carry one uh, a message from one person or one place to another. So it's interesting that in this Greek and Egyptian version, we do get the falcon that delivers the slippers. And she gets her prince um, due to the kind kindness of her nature and the kind animal spirit. And then from Haiti, we have the magic orange tree. And in this tale, there is a similar tree motif along with ash puddle. And the tree motif is happens to be an orange tree, of course. Um, the girl comes home from school and she sees a few oranges on the table. One by one, she eats them. She's starving because the stepmother hardly ever feeds her, just lets her go hungry. The stepmother's not home. So when the stepmother does get home and she sees the oranges gone, she starts complaining. Who ate my oranges? Who ate all those sweet, delicious oranges? Whoever did, they better pray for themselves because they won't be around much longer to pray. So she pretty much basically threatens the girl that she will be killed, uh, whether she would actually do it or not is another story, but how we talk to our children is important. Um, children don't always know what to believe and that could scare them. What they like about the retribution at the end of these tales is that they're in absolutes and black and white. That anyone who is being evil is going to be punished and that they won't be the ones punished so long as they are innately good. So when the girl is threatened by the stepmother, she gets very, very scared. She runs off into the woods to her mother's grave and cries over it. And there she finds an orange, orange seed and with her, and it turns into a sprout. And she starts saying these prayers, you know, please, orange tree, grow, grow, grow. Um, there's a number of prayers. It's um, repeated over and over. And each time she repeats it, well, that was redundant, repeated over and over, repeated a lot. Each time she does it, it grows higher and higher and bigger and bigger. And that's what we call a cumulative motif because any time that you repeat a phrase or um, a little magical prayer or magical charm spoken or otherwise use of, it accumulates in its power or in its growth and um, 
becomes more and more magical and and strong. So the tree gets so big from her praying so much over the tree for it to grow or under the tree for it to grow that she can't even reach the oranges to pick them anymore. So she finally realizes the magic of the tree and she asks the tree to lower itself down for her, which it does. And she can pick a bunch of oranges, which she carries home in her arms. And then when the stepmother sees all the oranges, she starts eating them all and she's twisting the girl's wrist violently, telling her to tell her where the tree is. So when the stepmother gets to the tree, the tree is not friendly to the stepmother. But this is at the girl's bidding, the tree by the mother's grave. It's the mother again avenging the stepmother for being cruel to her daughter. The mother has the tree um, break up into bits with the stepmother in it, reaching for the oranges. So the tree and the stepmother are just all broken up into bits. Now this has a similar motif to the African tale where the body of the false bride is chopped up into bits. So here we have once again, the flesh in bits. Um, and the girl becomes an orange vendor, has a magic orange tree where she makes her livelihood and never goes hungry again by selling oranges. So in the German Ash Padawan Haitian orange tree tales, they both have the magical tree motif. And in the Egyptian tale, the hawk carries the golden shoe to the prince, just like the dove in Ash Puddle that warns about the blood in the shoe. So it's kind of like um, a dove carrying an olive branch because peace Retribution brings peace. Peace will be restored. There will be no more arguing between these sisters or, um, or, or in the case of the Egyptian one, not sisters, but other girls. There's not going to be any more arguing and bickering over who deserves to be queen. So there's an olive branch that brings peace. Stith Thompson wrote about the universality of the folktale. So in this presentation, we got to see different versions from different places of the world. And there's just so many variants. Um, there, well, there are, you can them, but um, there's hundreds of them. So there are many, many different variations of each one of the tales that I just I, I just mentioned um, in some of the Cinderella's, there's even male Cinderella's, a young boy that um, is the orphan or the step child. But um, it's also more like um, Hansel and Gretel at that point, uh, because they want to get rid of him usually is, is the way it goes. He's so sometimes we get the motif of a young boy who is a Cinderella type character in being mistreated. But the motifs are a little different with that one. Children learn about other cultures through fairy tales. So it's great for multicultural awareness to read them fairy tales or have them when they're learning to read read fairy tales and the illustrations become very important because we see pictures of the landscapes, the different types of housing, homes, 
clothing. We see the different Cinderella's having different type of wedding gowns or wedding apparel, shoes. What are they made of? What fabric are they? How are they designed? Um, different types of metals, maybe used in jewelry you might find or in the shoes like the gold slippers, types of gems that might be embedded in the shoes or in the gowns. We see different types of animals. Um, we don't see hippopotami over in Germany, for instance. So when you read the Cinderella tale, you get to see the pictures of the hippopotamus talking to um, Rhodopus. And we know that that's, we're not going to find that in Germany in the uh, Black Forest, but that we might find that more along the waters in the um, the greenery of Egypt. Then we also get their customs and their beliefs from studying these tales. So in reviewing these several tales, we've seen key themes that appear in Cinderella type stories, including levels of violence and rewards for their virtue of kindness. We also learn in young girls and children, boy or girls, We'll also see that we need to be kind to ourselves. When you read Cinderella to a child or a child is reading and discussing it, they might say, oh, my sister doesn't have to do as many dishes as I do. Why am I the one who always has to take out the dishes or garbage? Why am I the one who has to take it, always do the dishes? Um, how come I have to clean my room, but her room's messy and she's not cleaning her room right now? And so you get these arguments and you know that from this, that it's not likely all the time abuse, that abuse is um, known by extent and duration. So these children are not they're saying, oh, I always have to do the dishes. Well, maybe not always. And they're probably not being servants to the whole household all day long. But um, you can find um, sometimes you might hear something that, you know, um, might sound like abuse, but most of the time, you hear that it's just normal chores. Um, and children learn from this too, that there are chores to do that the chores aren't really so bad if they compare them to Cinderella, who doesn't get to go anywhere to a ball. She has to do everything all the time and they make her sleep by the fireplace. But we do need, because the children align themselves with the Cinderella character, or young boys can see themselves in Cinderella also, or the prince, and what the prince would honor within his bride, or anyone for that matter, who is nurturing, um, just like they would honor their mother, so we see that kindness is a virtue all the way around in this tale, whether you are male or female, young or old, uh, it teaches us different values. So we see that folklore is a way of teaching fables and their morals, retribution. We saw in these tales, different types of rewards and punishments. It's almost as if divine fate and justice um, comes down to serve itself upon the characters. And that idea of retribution, divine fate, always overlaps somehow with 3A, 3B, or 3C, that we have faith in the world, that there is an order and logic to human experience and in the reasons and rewards to social responsibility. 
We could probably say that Cinderella or Ash Petal, after doing all the chores, knows how to serve others and how to be kind, how to be patient. And these would be very nice qualities to have as queen instead of somebody like the stepsisters who are very mean, very greedy, uh, cannot even listen to the voice of reason and still go ahead and chop off pieces of their feet when their mother tells them so just in order to be queen. So, and the logic is that retribution does come about and then we have the comments, of course, on human behavior and all of these different things. And we've often, well, we've already said, I've already said, I've often discussed some of these throughout these tales in this presentation, but that there are social rules and customs, rituals of behavior. You can see all these here, um, sorting who we are and what we stand for. Well, we know what the stepsisters and the stepmother stand for, and we know that Ash Puddle will not stand for cruelty and being cruel. In the African Cinderella, we see that they do not stand for dishonesty. Um, in African folklore, what is usually most important is the honesty. Also a Native American, it happens a lot in the Native American tales that there's an honesty motif because it is very important when you're living in a community, in a closed community, depending on one another in the way a Native American a tribe would have, or an African tribe would have, um, everybody has to do what they say they'll do. Everybody has to be where they say they will be. If they're on the watch to make sure that everyone's safe and that there's no um, warring factors or people or animals that could attack coming along while other people are sleeping, you have to be where you are. You have to, you have to keep that watch in order for everyone to survive. So the just survival of everyone depends on one and they all work together. So we can see in each of these tales what different people stand for. Now these criteria or these elements that come in these tales, it comes naturally. It's organic within the storytelling of the old days. And here they are in this list of folklore. Um, and it's just the same in the books and films we read and watch today in which any form of art, whether it's the oral tradition of way, way back before we had books or whether it's film and written published books now, any art form can only reflect the society with, within which it lives. Of course, you can have fantasy too for folk tales and fairy tales, but it will still be reflective of what is within the society from which it came. So it teaches, like we already said, manners, customs, morals, social rules, behaviors, and um, et cetera. So here we have our castle in the air. It could be in the sand, castles in the in the sand castle in the air and Feeny, the end. Feeny means the end and is usually found at the end of written fairy tales.